It was a brisk October evening in 2015, and I had just settled into the cool metal bleachers at the high school football field to watch our fifth grade son play his last big game of the season. As the play clock ticked and the helmets clinked together on the field, I suddenly felt my cell phone buzzing in my pocket. So I pulled it out and I took a quick glance and instantly a pit formed in my stomach. It was my boss's boss, the president of the company, calling me. Now, I don't think I felt this stomach-sinking sensation because I thought I was in trouble or something. I actually asked for this call to happen. You see, I had been leading the biggest deal in my company's sales funnel for more than a year. All eyes were on this deal. The pressure was so intense. Success in this deal would be transformational to our business, to our shareholders, and to me personally. So I went all in on this deal, working tirelessly, nights, weekends, holidays, sacrificing time with my friends, missing family vacation, executing every last detail to ensure we would win. And when it came down to it, when we got to the final play, we lost. Now sometimes when you lose, it's really, really hard to understand why. Maybe you weren't affable enough, maybe you just got outbid, but that wasn't the case here. The reason why we lost, because the leadership of my company wouldn't agree to a contract term that the client said was non-negotiable. Now, when I learned this was the reason, I was like, of course there's a path to get to yes, there's always a way. I just needed to talk to my leadership and plead my case. So, here was my opportunity. That was this phone call. So I hurried out of the bleachers and I climbed in the passenger seat of my car trying to find a quiet place to have this conversation. And after a couple brief pleasantries, I launched into my explanation filled with logic and reason of how this deal was still within our grasp. Quickly though, I was shut down. Now, the surprising part about being shut down at that moment for me was I wasn't shut down because my logic was wrong. Instead, I was shut down because I was too emotionally connected to this deal. Too emotionally connected? Really? I had never even considered such a thing in my work. The reality is, I'm a nurse. Since the age of 16, when I worked my first shift as a nursing assistant, I brought my whole emotional self to work every single day. I would feel joy and triumph when a patient defeated death. I would feel heartbreak and sorrow when they didn't. Almost all of my friends are nurses. We connected so quickly in the workplace to each other and to our work through our emotions. Our emotions were like a tether. They tethered us together and they tethered us to our work, getting us to come back day after day, shift after shift, even when it was really hard. But now, now suddenly that I'm on the business side of healthcare, I'm just supposed to forget about the fact that I attach my emotions and my work. I tried to follow his advice, for a little bit at least. Honestly, it just didn't work for me. And I think the reason why it didn't work is the truth is, the most beautiful gift we have as humans is our emotions. Our emotions define us. Our emotions inform our behavior. We act the way we do because of how we feel. And a really cool thing about the human brain is that we are wired to have our emotions frame our memories. In the absence of an emotional connection, quite frankly, we just don't remember. Think about it this way. Take yourself back to elementary school. Can you think of your favorite teacher? Okay, now bring yourself back to that classroom. Can you think of how that classroom smelled? Maybe. Can you try to think of something specific that that teacher taught you? Maybe not. So why is that person your favorite teacher? Why did they come to mind? The reality is that person stood out to you as your favorite teacher because of the emotional connection that you shared. Maybe this person helped you feel smart. Maybe this person helped you feel confident. Maybe in a big, scary school, this person helped you feel safe. It isn't the learning that frames our memories. It's the emotional connection that we share. So what does emotional connectedness look like in the workplace? 
I visualize it something like this. We are each our own human emotion map. Each one of us has a unique set of attributes that is informed and defined by a leading emotion. Now that leading emotion has a lot to do with how we act, how we behave, and how we show up at work. How we act and how we behave has a lot to do with our performance. Performance at work is critical because this is how others judge us. This is how they reward us, how they recognize us, and importantly, how they remember us. Now, if you imagine yourself standing in the center of this human emotional map, how would you describe your leading emotions? What is it that helps you show up? What is it that informs the way you act, ultimately manifesting in your performance? If you're having a hard time thinking of the words to describe it, you can't come up with it yourself, ask somebody else. Ask somebody you work with. How would you define me? How do I show up to you? Let me give you a personal example of this. I tend to lead with a lot of curiosity at work. Anyone who works with me knows I ask a lot of questions. Now, I ask a lot of questions not because I can't comprehend what I'm doing or what they're doing, and not that I don't trust what they're saying, but in my job, I have to make really big decisions. So by asking a lot of questions, this behavior that comes with curiosity, I'm closing the gap between the known and the unknown. How that manifests in my performance is I'm able to make better, higher quality decisions faster. My decision-making capacity and ability has been a key factor in my career success so far, allowing me to be recognized and rewarded and promoted. Now, as I was describing this human emotion model and sort of the way I lead with these emotions and how that connects through to my performance, one of my business mentors said to me, well, you know, April, the way you do that, that's really what gives you an edge. Those are your edges. That's how you stand out from the crowd. It's how you're distinguishing yourself. Don't ever let anyone round your edges. I found those words to be brilliant. He was exactly right. I don't have a secret sauce to be successful, but what I do is attach to my work. I lead with my emotions, and I don't round my edges. Now, something happens in work over time, though. Just as I was experiencing on that call in my car on that day, the very thing that was helping me get recognized was also what was getting me criticized. Now, maybe that's happened to you, too. Maybe you were the person that showed up with a ton of passion at work. You were going above and beyond, leading every committee you could, only to be met with someone telling you to reel it back in. Or maybe you got a new job, and the leadership hired you because they wanted your fresh blood. They wanted you to challenge the status quo and to introduce new ideas. And meeting after meeting, your ideas get rejected. What do you do? You stop offering ideas. One by one your edges are rounded. Emotion by emotion, you detach from your work. Now, it's common to think that emotionally detaching from work is a good thing to do. Our business literature for more than a decade has warned us of the health hazards of being too connected to our work. A quick Google search for the words, how to detach from work, will result in nearly 81 million responses in 0.4 seconds. The results are clear. Today, we live in a world where 60% of people report being completely emotionally detached from their work. Another 20% of people report being utterly miserable in their job. And sadly, occupational suicides have never been higher in wealthy nations than they are right now. Employers everywhere are scrambling, trying to find a tourniquet to stop the turnover bleeding within their organizations, trying to figure out how to re-engage disengaged employees and solve their staffing shortages just to keep their operations going. When you put all of this together, I can't help but ask the challenging question. Is emotional detachment at work actually the problem, or is it really the answer? Now, I understand this is a complicated dynamic, and there's a lot of factors at play. First of all, companies have an outright responsibility to foster cultures and norms that embrace diversity in thought, opinion, and people. Individuals, on the other hand, 
also have an incredible opportunity and responsibility to learn what your edges are, to resist this sort of edge-rounding behavior that can happen at work, and to lead with emotion, with healthy attachment to your job. Now, maybe you're a person that sits somewhere in the middle of this. Maybe you had shown up with a lot of attachment to work. You were subject to edge-rounding behavior, and over a while of time, you stopped attaching. Now is your opportunity to think about choosing a different path. Choose to attach in healthy ways. Find your edges and apply them. Maybe you're a person who's fresh on your career journey. You're just getting started. You have your edges, you know them, you want to use them, and you want to protect them. I have two thoughts that I want to share with you this evening about how I think you can help that journey. The first thought is that, that you're, if you're wondering, what edge do I lead with? Where do I even start this process of reattachment? My advice to you is to start with passion. Passion is the most powerful edge that anyone can bring into their work, into their life. Passion is, is capable of inducing whole body emotional responses in ways that really nothing else can. Take startup entre entrepreneurs, for example. Startup entrepreneurs are able to convince investors to hand over huge sums of money to them because they have a great idea and a viable market, but also because they bring incredible passion. When David Heath and Randy Goldberg founded Bomba's sock company, it wasn't because they were super passionate about socks. I mean, let's get real. Unless your sock right now is all bunched up in the front of your shoe, you forgot you had one on. But if David and Randy weren't passionate about socks, then why did they start a sock company? And how did they get Shark Tank to give them a bunch of money? David and Randy shared a passion for homelessness. When they learned from a Facebook post in 2013 that socks were the most requested donation item at homeless shelters, they sought out on a mission to end the suffering that comes with homelessness. Also, Bomba's now one of Shark Tank's most profitable investments of all time. Whether we want to admit it or not, those of us that are participating in the workforce, we are going to spend 100,000 hours of our lives at work. Should we really try to detach our passion from our work, round that edge, tuck it away, and maybe bring it out for a passion project? I don't think that's going to lead to greater success, greater happiness. If passion is your edge, never let anyone round it. The second thought that I want to share is actually a little bit more of a warning. It's a warning about what happens when you start leading with your edges. When you start engaging in emotional connection and emotional responses with other people, you are bound to hit resistance. Why? The natural tendency of most people is not to do things that are emotionally hard. In fact, they will find the path of least resistance at all costs. Deloitte tells us that 60 to 70% of large-scale change projects in business fail because people won't push through resistance. It kind of makes sense if you think about 60% of people being emotionally detached at work. Why would you push through something that's really hard? I believe the opposite can be true in business, though. I believe resistance is a gift, and here's why. When you have met a moment of resistance, you can recognize that you are on the very edge of a breakthrough. Being able to push through that resistance allows you to get to that breakthrough. In a moment when you are up against a resisting party or you're in a moment of resistance, that person's brain is lit up. Dopamine is surging, synapses are firing. They are capable in that moment of paying attention to you. They are not distracted. It's right here in this moment where you have your opportunity to be remembered. You have your opportunity to lead with that emotional edge and form a connection. I have a personal example of this. In our company, we introduced a new technology in January of 2020, this whole digital transformation. It changed the way hundreds of people had to do their jobs. As you can imagine, retraining hundreds of people who have done their job one way for a very long time to do it differently was not exactly popular. The resistance was massive, daily ploys and excuses of why we needed to go back to the old way. However, eight weeks after we went live, a pandemic hit our nation. And our nation's hospitals needed our business more than ever before. Had we not pushed through the resistance, we never would have been able to meet our, our, our customers' demands. 
Because of this transformation, we achieved five times productivity growth. And as a result, we've now achieved nine times revenue growth, writing a story that's never been told in our industry. Resistance was a gift. So what I think I was feeling that day in the car on that phone call wasn't some sort of stomach sinking response to losing. Instead, it was the words of my intuition saying to me, April, this company is trying to round your edges, trying to take away the very things that make you special. Stay here and you'll never find the success that you'd always dreamed about. So for me, I chose a different path. I quit that job. And I took a different job in a company that allows me to show up wholly emotional and allows me to attach in healthy ways to the work that I do and to the people that I work with. I'm honored to call the people that I work with some of my very best friends. And I'm so proud of the work that we get to do every single day through our passion. So this is what I ask of you. What are your edges? Can you name them? If not, could you try? If you know what they are, do you use them? Our world has never had more room for difference makers, and we need you right now. So if you're wondering where to start, start with passion. It won't fail you. If you're wondering what to do in that moment of resistance when you hit that edge-rounding behavior, embrace that moment, recognize that it's a gift, and push through to the breakthrough on the other side. It's in those moments where you'll be remembered. It's in those moments where you'll stand out. Thank you.